Good afternoon. We want to take this opportunity to welcome you to our midweek Bible study here at the Luxahoma Church of Christ. We are thankful that you have uh, joined us in this way. And if you're, again, if you're visiting with us through the internet, we want you to know that we are honored that you've chosen to be with us in this way. And we hope that our time together certainly will be a benefit uh, to each other as we study uh, from the Word of God. Uh, before we begin our, uh, our study tonight, I'm going to ask you to join me in a, in a word of prayer. Our gracious and almighty Heavenly Father, we praise Thee and honor Thy name. We recognize Thee, Father, as the creator and sustainer of this life. And we recognize, Father, Thy mercy and long-suffering that has been our benefit even to this day. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for allowing us to see the dawn of this day and for all the blessings that are contained in it. We pray that as we strive to walk through this life that certainly those benefits and blessings will continue to be ours as we, as we strive to live a life that's faithful in, uh, in thy sight. We are thankful for the Luxahoma congregation and for her faithful leaders. We're thankful, Father, for their wisdom and certainly for their um, protection as well as their guidance. We pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, we will always uh, see fit to make sure that we follow them as they walk away that is pleasing unto thee. We pray for those who are sick and, and afflicted. We're especially mindful of those of our congregation. We pray, Heavenly Father, your, your healing hand uh, providence will certainly be with them, that they can be restored back to a measure of health. We rejoice in the good news that we've heard from so many that have recovered, and we are grateful. Uh, we are so very grateful uh, for that fact. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who have been affected by this pandemic, and we pray that, uh, that Thou will continue to watch over them and over our community and our nation, and we pray, Father, that a vaccine can be found very soon. We pray that Thou will protect those that are, that are fighting this pandemic on the front line, and all of those, again, who may have been affected. Our Father, we Pray that Thou will be with us this night as we have the opportunity to study. We pray that we will certainly handle Thy Word in the fashion that Thou would have us to do it. And we pray, Father, that we will receive every intended blessing. And at last, Father, we pray that when this life is no more, that we can be ushered into the very beauty of Thy presence to have a home with Thee in eternity and live with Thee forever. For this is our prayer in Christ's name, and amen. I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, and our chapter that we'll be studying this night will be Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. If you'll be opening your Bibles there, we will begin reading in verse number 1, and we will read through the six verses of this chapter. Here the psalmist writes, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, but his seat is in the, but he nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff with the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now this psalm is attributed to David, and when we stop and think about the 
the outline of the entire chapter here, we can see that it's really a pretext to the entire book. When you look at the words that, that the inspired writer is giving to us here, it's, it's basically about two choices that man has to make. He, he, has a, uh, he has a choice either to do right or he has a choice to do that which is wrong. And while some people today say, well, there's more choices, and they might say that there's a, a gray area by which a man can participate, but not according to this and not according to the Word of God. But if the idea is that we have before us really the very progression of how man can live through this life and how a man can progress to those things which are right in the eyes of God, or a way that a man can choose to do wrong and continue to progress through that way of life, which would be contrary to the will of God. And so our study tonight takes us to this particular chapter as we begin looking at what, what is God trying to convey in this particular chapter. As he sets a tone for the entire 150 chapters of this book of Psalms as it is setting the, uh, the foundation for us, it, it allows us to determine, to make a choice before we go any further, and to know the reasons behind those choices. In other words, that we can certainly be well-equipped to do the things which are going to be in harmony with God's will, or they're going to be contrary to God's will. So, Again, I hope you have your Bibles as we begin our study uh, tonight, as we study through Psalm chapter 1. The first thing that we see in the very first verse is a pathway to righteousness. A pathway to righteousness. Notice again as we begin reading in verse number 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, think about this. A man makes his way through life, and the word blessed here is a word that, that is actually a, a very generic word in the sense that it can literally mean happy. That, that happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor does he stand in the way of the sinner, nor does he uh, sit in the seat of the scornful. And, and so we have a, a contrast here. You have an individual who has a, has a choice to make. He can go down this road here that, uh, where the ungodly will walk, or he can, he can stand where the sinners stand, or he can sit where, where God would consider those individuals scornful or, or despised or abominable. And so he brings to light the idea that man has this choice in which to make. But the idea is, he says, if you want to be happy, if the, if the choice of happiness is where you want to be, then you will not choose to walk where the ungodly walk, nor stand where the sinners stand, nor sit where those who are abominable in the eyes of God. I think that when we think about the progression that we, that we see in these conditions, it's a progression that God actually taught all the way back in the very beginning. If you remember back in Genesis chapter number 19, where Lot and his family had had resided uh, in or near the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the idea that the wickedness of the city, that they were literally going to be overcome with the wickedness of the city if they stayed in those cities. And so when you look at verse number 15, here Moses records for us when he says, And when the morning arose, then the angel hastened Lot, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed with the iniquity of the city. Genesis 19, verse 15. 
And so he goes on to see that, that okay, a messenger comes to, to him, an angel comes to him, he, he tells him to get up, and he says, where you are right now is not safe. Where you are right now, it may cost you not only your physical life, but it will cost you your spiritual life if you choose to stay here. Had Lot sinned? Well, no. Had, 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 it was it Lot that committed these iniquities? No. Had, not at all. But it was the idea that, that he would allow himself to be in that particular way that if he stayed there much longer the chances are he would have been consumed. And God would show us how serious this is. Because when you come down to verse number 28, then you begin to see exactly what Abraham saw. Notice what he says in verse number 28. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went up as a smoke of a furnace. That would have been his life. He would have been consumed because God was going to bring punishment down on those individuals and the sin of those individuals in those cities and had Lot stayed there. Lot was told to get out, don't look back, Because you do not want to be associated with this. You don't want to be linked to this. You don't want to be attached to this. And so when we go back to our text, here the psalmist is writing the, the very idea of how man possibly could think that would lead to a decision that it would allow him to be in the very same place that Lot and his family was had they not gotten out and listen to the message of the righteous messenger. So happy is that man, or blessed is that man, that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor does he stand in the way of the sinner, nor does he sit in the seat of the scornful. And so he will not allow himself to be attached, associated, or even seen in that position. Well, as a matter of fact, when we come to the New Testament and we see what God talks about when a man is born again, he is a new creature or creation. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Notice what Paul says here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He's a new man. He, he has gone down into the watery graves to bury that old man so the new man may rise and walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3, and 4. And so that new man is not associated with the world any longer in the sense that he doesn't, he doesn't talk like the world. He, he doesn't walk like they do in the world, his manner of life or conduct. He doesn't allow himself to, to look like the world. He, he doesn't allow himself to be immodest or he doesn't allow himself to, to cause attention in such a way that he could be thought of as being associated with those who live in a sinful way. See, there's a pathway of righteousness that God expects us to follow. That was one of the foundations of the entire teaching of Jesus Christ when he was here upon the earth. When you look at Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse number 13, there Jesus said that we have a choice here between the two pathways. And he says one is narrow and one is broad. And they both lead to a destination for which God would make very clear and if you'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 and look with me beginning in verse number 13. Again, that's Matthew chapter 7. And let's look at verse number 13. Here are the words of Jesus when he says, Enter in ye at the straight gate. 
For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, that's pretty clear. Jesus, as he's wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount, he's telling these people that, that everyone that was in attendance that day, he was showing them how to prepare themselves to be citizens of a kingdom that would be established in Acts chapter 2. This is a pathway in which God wants me to travel, and it is. But we forget sometimes that the psalmist actually put what it's like when an individual doesn't choose the pathway of righteousness. But notice our second point, if you will. Not only do we see the pathway of righteousness, we see the pleasure of righteousness. Now, some people might say, now wait a minute. Are you here to tell me that there's actually uh, pleasure in religion or pleasure in, in, in doing what's right in the eyes of God? Uh, are you, you meaning to tell me that a person can actually go through life being right with God and be happy about it? Well, I could tell you that all day long, but, but the answer is that that's exactly what God is saying. Look at verse number two. Uh, look at this individual that chose not, not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But notice verse number two. He says, but his delight, his ultimate happiness is where? In the law of the Lord. And it's so pleasurable because he meditates therein day and night. It, there, there is no, there's no room in the sense of, of the world creeping in with this man because he finds so much pleasure and delight in the law of the Lord that this is the priority, this is the number one thing in his entire life. And that's hard for some to understand. Uh, that's, that's hard for someone to understand how they could take a book and their lives be dedicated and committed to everything that God has said. That's unfathomable to, to some people, but... but it, According to the psalmist, this man, this happy man or this blessed man, he's delighted. He's delighted to have his life consumed, not with the iniquity of any city or not the iniquity of any world, but he is delighted to be consumed with what God has said. Now, that's amazing. That's amazing, and as a matter of fact, if we were to open our Bibles and go a little further into the book of Psalms, if we look at Psalm chapter 119, Psalm chapter 119. Now, look with me, if you will, at verse number 11. Psalm 119, verse 11, this is a passage that, that you uh, probably have memorized from a very young age, or perhaps it's a... It's a passage you've heard many times throughout your life. But, but notice what the psalmist here says. He says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119.11. Thy word have I hid in my heart, or my, my mind, that, that I might not sin against you. The chances are so remote that I would intentionally fall away from God because I've taken his word and I've placed it within myself. I'm consumed with it. I eat it. I digest it. I live by it. 
And my life is different because I have escaped the pollutions of the world and am enjoying the pleasure of righteousness. You know, a lot of times we read this verse, number 11, and we don't often know how we even got to verse 11. But it actually, if you'll back all the way up to verse number 1, it kind of gives us a road map, if you will, a, a pathway uh, that shows us how this individual got to this point. Now remember, in verse 2 of, of Psalm chapter 1, his delight was in the law of the Lord, and his law did he meditate day and night. Now, read with me, beginning in verse number 1 of Psalm 119. Notice what he says. He says, blessed, there's that word again, or happy are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to do thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Now stop right here for just a moment. Look at verses number 4 and 5 again. All right, this man is obviously happy because he's walking in a direction that God wants him to walk. God said, I want you to go this pathway. This individual says, well, I, I am happy to do that. But watch. He says, you've commanded us, and he's talking about God. He says, thou hast commanded us, commanded us to do what? To keep thy precepts. Well, that's one thing, but that's not all that he said. He says, you've commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently, all out, with every bit of my being, every ounce of my being. He said, that's what you've commanded. Now look at the attitude in verse number five. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Now, the opposite of this would be, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. I am so happy, I am so blessed that you have sought fit to direct me. And so he brings it all before this happy man so that he absolutely can say, wait a minute now, oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. But notice what the end result is, verse 6. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. That I'm not ashamed. The more you give me, the more I want. The more of your law that you give me, the more of your statutes that I learn, the more the commandments I, I understand, I want more. I never want to go through this life, according to the happy man, as being ashamed. There are people's lives that are absolutely 100% being destroyed today simply because they have no direction, they desire no direction, and they live shameful lives because they are without direction. We know how important that is, don't we? Because Jeremiah even said that I know it's not in man to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. In other words, we're not capable of choosing that pathway of righteousness and experiencing the pleasure of righteousness without God directing what that is and where it is. There are people today literally spending millions of dollars 
trying to find a way to be happy. And God says, here it is. Just let me guide you. Let me direct you. And you will find eternal happiness. A happiness without end. But notice verse 7. And because he's not ashamed of allowing his life to be directed in this way, he said, I will praise thee with all uprightness of heart when I shall learn thy righteous judgments. As I continue to do this, as I continue to be dedicated and committed to you, as I continue to learn what it is you would have me to do, I will praise you. I will recognize you, an ultimate and very distinct recognition that you're like no one else, that you're the one and only. You are the true and the living God and creator of all. Then his mind's made up in verse number 8 through 11. He says, I will keep thy statutes. O forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Now verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So notice, if we will, we have seen the pathway of righteousness. We have seen the pleasure in righteousness. But now, follow me, if you will, as we look at the position of righteousness. If we go back to Psalm chapter 1 and we look at verses 3 through the end of the chapter, we begin to see a position that God desires us to be. But again, it's our choice as to whether or not we do that. But being in this position where God desires us to be, then we see all the benefits. We become the benefactors of what God is offering. So we have to be in this position, the position of righteousness. Read with me beginning in verse number 3. And he says, and he shall be like a tree. Who's the he? Well, it's the blessed man. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, think about this. Here's this man, and he is described as a tree. But not a tree, it's out in some pasture. It's not some tree that's planted next to a road. It's not a tree planted in the middle of a yard. But he's a tree that's planted by the rivers, not a pond, not a pool, but he's by the rivers of the waters. So he's planted by the rivers of the waters, that water is constantly running. That water is constantly bringing with it the purity, the nutrients, everything this tree needs for its root systems to stand strong and to stand firm. So much so that that which the tree produces, and again, the tree is the man, the happy man, that what he produces are the leaves in which his creator expected him to produce. That's his fruit that he expects him to produce. He made a tree to produce leaves. He made a man to produce a will that's in harmony with God. 
So he's like this tree planted by the rivers of the water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. It works just the way God says it'll work. But he says, but the ungodly are not so. Verse 4. So the ungodly are not so. It's not that they won't live. It's not that they won't be sustained in some fashion. But they won't produce like that that's planted next to the river. But notice what he says. But they are like a chaff which the wind driveth away. It's like when the wind blows hard enough, they won't stand. They can't be sustained. It'll just blow them over. Or whatever it produces, it'll just blow it down the road, blow it into the field, blow it into the road, wherever it may land. It wanders. So the conclusion is found in verses 5 and 6 when he says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand it in the judgment, nor sinners in the seat or in the congregation of the righteous. And he says, so they're going to be separated. The ungodly are not going to stand in the judgment, not in the fact that they won't be in the judgment, because all will appear before God in the judgment, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. But, but what we're talking about here is they won't stand with the righteous in that part of the judgment, that sentencing on when God will say to those, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord, but rather they will hear, because they are not in the congregation of the righteous, rather they are going to hear, depart from me, ye that work with iniquity, for I never knew you. Well, that makes it very clear, doesn't it? That makes it very clear in the sense that he says right here in verse number 5 that there will be a separation in the sense that you can't put the godly with the ungodly and vice versa, but rather they'll be separated and these right here will get their just reward and this right here will get their just reward. And so where do we stand? Is, is this something that, that God really knows about my life? Is it something that God really is trying to convey to me in my life? Is it something that God really wants me to know in order to direct my life? Well, look at verse 6. For the Lord knoweth the ways of the righteous. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. He draws a magnificent conclusion in the fact that God knows all. He knows who the righteous are. He knows who the ungodly are. Therefore, his reward and his punishment will be just what it should be. Now think about it with me, if you will. Man has a decision that he has to make, and, and the psalmist made this very clear, that here's a man that he's happy when he chooses not to go the pathway of the unrighteous, but rather when he chooses to go the pathway of the righteous. But then that man is continuing his happiness when he chooses not to stand in the pollutions of the world, but will stand in the pleasures of righteousness. But then that man continues that happy life as he continues to be directed by God not to be in the position of hearing God say, depart from me, 
but rather being in the position of the righteous to hear the words, well done. Now, from this day forward, You and I should never say we don't have a choice in the matter. Because when it comes to our eternal souls, that'll be the greatest choice that you and I will ever make. And we can choose what's right or we will choose what is wrong. I appreciate your attention this evening. I appreciate you joining us through the avenue of the internet. And may we conclude our time together with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Again, Father, we thank thee for the wonderful day. We're thankful, Father, for this avenue of study. And we thank thee, Father, for allowing us to make the choice of whether we will do what's right or whether we will choose to do what's wrong. May we always have the strength, may we always have the courage to travel a pathway of righteousness, to enjoy the pleasures of that righteousness, and always be in the position of the reward for that righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.